Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my second lecture in fractal finance. And this lecture is entitled Modeling Discontinuity and Fractality for Financial Assets. Fractality. So before we start with this lecture, let us briefly discuss what is a fractal. Uh, recall that Beno Mandelbrot referred to himself as a fractalist and is well recognized for his contribution to the field of fractal geometry, which is a discipline in mathematics, and which included coining the word fractal, and that he developed, moreover, the theory of roughness and self-similarity in nature. Beno Mandelbrot gave a TED talk yeah, on this topic which you can easily find on YouTube, which I also strongly recommend you to watch. In his popular science book, Scale, which you see here on the uh, right-hand side of the presentation, the theoretical physicist Geoffrey West highlights on page 130, mathematicians had recognized for a long time that there were geometrics that lay outside the canonical boundaries of the classical Euclidean geometry that has formed the basis for mathematics and physics since ancient times. The traditional framework that many of us have been painfully and joyfully exposed to implicitly assumes that all lines and surfaces are smooth and continuous. Novel ideas that evoked concepts of fractals were viewed as fascinating form extend formal extensions of academic mathematics but we are not generally perceived as playing any significant role in the real world. It fell to the French-American mathematician, Bino Mandelbrot, to make the crucial insight that, quite to the contrary, crinkliness, discontinuity, roughness and self-similarity, in a word, fractality, are in fact ubiquitous features of the complex world we live in. So again, Obviously, uh, the concept of fractality, it incorporates uh, crinkliness uh, as opposed to uh, smoothness, uh, discontinuity as opposed to continuity, uh, roughness and self-similarity. Yeah, all these belongs together. So here we see some examples for fractals. Uh, uh, the Cambridge Dictionary defines fractal as follows a complicated pattern in mathematics built from simple repeated shapes that are reduced in size every time they are repeated. Yeah. So we see here uh, in the first part of this uh, uh, presentation, you see a triangle yeah, and if you put it basically, uh, if you put three of these triangles, yeah, uh, place it basically where, where the, uh, on, the, on the edges of the triangle, yeah, you see uh, and you repeat this pattern every time, uh, you see here a couple of iterations, you end up with a quite complicated pattern yeah. after just a few uh, simple iterations. Yeah. So a pattern that looks similar no matter what scale you look at it, that's a fractal. The more you zoom in, the more you see the same pattern emerging. Yeah. So the same thing happens when zooming out. Yeah. You, so you see the same pattern uh, of this triangle. But also uh, in nature, obviously, we uh, observe fractals every, everywhere we look at, more or less. So you see here on the uh, left hand side, uh, broccoli. Yeah? If you zoom in, yeah, you see that, that uh, you, could, you could not distinguish uh, what, is the, uh, uh, which, what is the resolution of the broccoli. Yeah? So if you zoom in, a, a, a small part uh, resembles the whole. Yeah? And here on the right hand side you see the peacock. Yeah? It's also, you see also a, a repeating a self-similar pattern yeah? that repeats itself all the time. So these are just uh, three simple uh, examples of fractals. But what about finance? Yeah? So in finance, fractality is manifested in statistical self-similarity. Yeah? Because we are dealing simply with, uh, with time series of data. Yeah? And here we can consider the following graphs. So the first two 
uh, are log prices for the Dow Jones 30. And one of the graphs uses daily data and the other one uses monthly data. And the third and the fourth graphs illustrate the corresponding series in terms of log returns, which is what we usually deal with in financial research. So if you just steer, and obviously by intention, I uh, did not reveal the y-axis, yeah? so I did not reveal the scale of the data, only the pattern. And if you just watch on these graphs, you obviously cannot distinguish between what is daily data, what is monthly data. Okay? And the same is for the return series. If you watch the return series, three and four, you see the same pattern. Uh, it, it is the same uh, pattern. Yeah? So you see some outliers there every now and then, and the same evolution. So what you also see here, we have roughly 1,000 observations. Yeah? So, and again, one, of the, one set of the data is 1,000 uh, monthly observations, and the other set is 1,000 daily observations. And again, by just steering on the graphs, you cannot see the resolution. Yeah? The resolution can be either monthly or data, but you cannot distinguish between it. So here we have uh, the same uh, continued, and here I reveal the scale on the y-axis, and also uh, I tell you here that obviously the left-hand side we have monthly log prices, and the time, the time period is from January 1939 until March uh, 2022, which is now, more or less. And we see on the right-hand side we are dealing with log prices, and the time period is 17th January 1996, until 31st December 1999. Yeah? And those of you who are familiar with the, uh, what has happened there, obviously uh, the time period 1996 until 1999, uh, we observed increasing stock prices uh, around the world, yeah? and it was the so-called dot-com bubble formation. Yeah? And we see, uh, on, if you just consider now the scale, we see on the left-hand side, using monthly data, yeah? So we see the scale is from roughly 5 until 10. Okay? 5 until 10. So it's, it doubles basically from 5 to 10. Uh, on the right hand side, however, we see the scale is moving from, in the beginning, from 8.5. Of, of course, we have rising prices, so 8.5 until 9.2. Yeah? So, so the scale uh, where it moves, so the, or the, let's say the range, the moving range, uh, it's much less for daily data, and it must be like that, obviously. It's much less for daily data as opposed to monthly data. So the moves in monthly data, the range, is much higher than for daily data, though the pattern looks the same. And the same is obviously here for, if we consider log returns, yeah, again, so on the right-hand side, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we are dealing with monthly returns, and we see they move, obviously, until minus 25. And this is obviously the, uh, the October 87, yeah, where the stock market crashed. Yeah, we see a huge negative return, never experienced before in financial history. Uh, and we see also positive returns of roughly 12, 13%, a couple of times. And again, negative returns up to minus 25%. Yeah? So this is uh, the monthly resolution, uh, and now if you watch on graph 4, the daily resolution, so we see the pattern is the same. Yeah? We have outliers every now and then, which is discontinuity. Yeah? This is the discontinuity that we're talking about, uh, and then, but, but we see if we watch on uh, daily data, so the range is from minus 6, yeah? we see one outlier, uh, minus 6, then another return uh, is it's roughly minus 5%. Yeah? And we see positive returns there ranging, they, they reach up to 4%. Yeah? So we see that the, again, uh, that the range of the data, it's, it's uh, much more constrained for daily data as opposed to monthly data, even though the uh, evolution looks the same. So that's obviously one manifestation of statistical self-similarity uh, in financial market data. So, irrespective of the frequency, respectively 
resolution, so, res so the resolution is obviously the, the, the frequency of the data, the data looks the same. Uh, it's self-similar. So another manifestation of self-similarity is, so if we now disregard from, uh, from different frequencies or different resolution, resolutions, if we now look at the evolution itself, so we see also uh, self-similarity within each time series. So if we, let's have a look on the left-hand side, we have the monthly resolution, monthly log prices, and we see uh, a certain pattern, yeah, so that prices move, move down, then they move up, and then they move down again, and they move up and they move down again. So we see, and I obviously here, I uh, mark this as uh, blue uh, bubbles here every now and then. So you see, within these bubbles, this formation is repeating itself across time. And we see the same if we watch daily data, yeah, so daily log prices. So if we watch daily data, we see the same pattern. The stock prices, they, they make a bump down, then they move up, and they make a bump down again. So financial economists would call this probably uh, bull and beer markets. Yeah? So um, it is a self-repeating pattern within the data series, but this repeating pattern, it is not predictable. So that's the important point, that this self-repeating pattern is not predictable. Sometimes it, it can take longer time, sometimes it takes less time. Yeah, you, you can see it here on the uh, steering uh, on the graphs, you can see that there is an irregularity in this pattern. So it's the, the, the length of the cycle is, is not always the same. And so, but this, uh, the basic pattern is repeating itself. So, and also, uh, if we see now uh, on the uh, log prices, let's, or the uh, log returns, uh, graph 3 and 4, it is very similar. Yeah? So, you see that uh, these this, this, this bumps, if, you, if, if what we have observed in the uh, log price series, okay, if we go back to the log price series, so this moving down, moving up, yeah? then moving slightly down again, and moving up again, so this pattern is also visible in the return series, of course. But there it looks a little bit different, obviously. So I, I marked it here in red. It is a U-shaped pattern, but reversed. Okay, so returns are, are negative. They're clustering around uh, a negative where they, are, where they have a high variation, yeah? uh, moving up and, and, and down, and then they tend to uh, move move up the returns with a smaller vari variation in returns and mostly ab ab above the zero line so we have mo uh, more positive returns and then it goes down again okay so the variation increases the, the return variation increases again yeah and uh, we have more uh, let's say uh, this the returns are more skewed to the negative ones okay so again a financial economist would call this probably bull and beer market okay um, we call it here in our course uh, statistical self-similarity. Yeah? It's a, it's a self-repeating pattern within the uh, data series. Yeah? And we see this, we observe this here, obviously I took uh, monthly uh, log returns and you would see the same pattern manifested in daily uh, log returns. Yeah? So it's the, so again, this self-similarity, so it, it has two manifestations. First of all, if you use different resolutions, respectively different frequencies of the data, uh, the data, you cannot distinguish between the, uh, the, um, the, if it's daily data, monthly data, weekly data, or, or quarterly data, okay, it all looks the same, it has the same pattern. And another manifestation is obviously that even within each data series, it, is, it has self-repeating patterns. Yeah? So this is important to bear in mind. So key features, what are the key features of financial markets or financial assets, asset markets? So we have discontinuity, we have now talked about it quite, quite a lot, and we have statistical self-similarity. And at third part, we have the memory. And what we talk now what we would li like to do right now is 
to model the first two features that somehow belong together, which you will see. Uh, it's the discontinuity and statistical self similarity. So the question arises, how can we model that? It's obviously not the normal distribution, what financial economists uh, still believe. So, some of you might be familiar with the so-called 80-20 law. And some of you might also have heard about Wilfredo Pareto, yeah, that somehow belongs together. So, who was Wilfredo Pareto? So, it was obviously in a, an Italian guy, yeah? The Italian Wilfredo Pareto, born in July 1848, was known as a civil engineer, a sociologist, economist, a political scientist, and philosopher. Now, so you see that there are some similarities between Benoit Mandelbrot and Wilfredo Pareto. Yeah, both of them were sort of interested in uh, different disciplines of uh, science. Um, like Pino Mandelbrot, Wilfred Pareto accomplished several important contributions to economics, especially in the study of income distribution and in the analysis of individual choices. Furthermore, he was the first who discovered that income follows a specific power law distribution, nowadays known as the Pareto distribution, Pareto's 80-20 law or Pareto principle. So all these obviously are synonyms and they describe the same thing. The Pareto 80-20 law was built on Pareto's obs empirical observation that 80% of the wealth in Italy belonged to about 20% of the population. The Pareto distribution in its, or in its original form postulates that 20% of the largest observations, for instance, wealthiest people make out 80% of the overall total or in this example the, over, the overall wealth or the cumulative wealth in a population. In a Gaussian world, if you would assume a normal distribution, if you would assume that wealth uh, is normally distributed, 20% uh, of the largest observations or the wealthiest people would only make out 44% of the overall total. So that's obviously a huge gap, okay? The normal distribution uh, obviously does not account uh, for the same concentration. Uh, it's obviously concentration. The, the Pareto 80-20 distribution, it postulates concentration that a small fraction of, of individuals uh, have a high part or the lion part of the cumulative overall total. And in the Gaussian world, this is obviously not the case. Yeah? So it's almost the Pareto 80-20 distribution tells you that it's almost twice as that the, that the concentration is almost twice as much as the Gauss as the Gaussian distribution would suggest, which is important to bear in mind. So what this brings us to the next point: uh, what are the differences between the Gaussian world and the real world? So here, obviously, I have uh, given you a, a table, a simple table. You see the uh, Gaussian distribution and the, Pareto di and the Pareto distribution, which we compare here in this table. So we see, we said already that 20% of the largest observation, if you consider the Gaussian distribution, 20% uh, of the largest ob observations correspond to 44% of the cumulative total. If we have the Pareto distribution, it's 80% of the cumulative total. Now we can ask us, okay, uh, what about the 20% of largest observation of the 20%? So now we have 20% of 20%, so it's 4%. So what, what about the 4% of largest observations? How much do they correspond to in the Gaussian world? Here the table reveals that the 4% of largest observations, respectively 20% of the previous 20%, make out 12% of the cumulative total, which is not obviously not that much. If we consider the Pareto distribution, 20% of those largest 
or the largest 20% of the largest 20%, which is the largest 4% of the total, they correspond to 64%, which is much more, which is basically, if, if we can, if we would consider how much is it more, it's five, more than five times, right? Five times would be 60%, uh, so it's slightly more, more than five times as much as the Gaussian world suggests. Yeah. Uh, and now, this is now the interesting part of the Pareto distribution, or of this distribution class. Uh, once we know that 20% of the largest observation correspond to 80% of the cumulative total, then we know also that 20% of 20%, so the largest 20% of the largest 20%, correspond to 80% of 80%. So this is one important feature that I would like you to uh, know about the uh, Pareto distribution, or this distribution class, which is obviously very different from uh, the Gaussian world. We will also come, come back to that later. So 80% of 80% is 64%. So we see there's much higher degree of concentration. And we can do this iteration one more time. So what about 20% of 20% of 20% or 20% of 4%? Now we're dealing, now we want to know, okay, how much do, do the largest 1% of the distribution make out from the cumulative total. If we have the Gaussian world, we see here that 1% of the largest observation, or 20% of 20% of 20% of the largest observations, they correspond only to 3.6% of the cumulative total, which is a tiny, tiny fraction. If we consider the Pareto distribution, we know what, how, we, how we can easily calculate it. It's 80% from 80% from 80% and that is rounded 50%. So that is an interesting figure, so that means that only that 1% of the, the, the largest 1% of the overall distribution yeah, make out 50% of the cumulative. And this is in terms of, 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 you can think about what does it mean in terms of wealth. So it's an enormous concentration, a very tiny fraction of people uh, have the, 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 the uh, line part of the, of the wealth, okay? This is basically uh, what we can learn here. And obviously, uh, people have different opinions, different scholars have different opinions, and they will, if you read the book from Geoffrey West, yeah, he, uh, he has a, a slightly different interpretation of this distribution class, and that's of course fine, this distribution class has different interesting features yeah, that you might figure out along the way if you study these distributions. But for my course, I would like to pay attention uh, to this feature, to con concentration. Yeah? So this distribution class is able to, uh, to um, model concentration, which we observe in the real life across different data sets. So the Pareto distribution is only one specific distribution of a distribution class which is termed to, as power laws. And again, the book from Geoffrey West is titled Scale. It, the whole book deals with power laws. Yeah? And mathematically, it, it is defined as P from X, which is the probability density function, is equal with C, which is a constant term, times the uh, a variable X to the power of minus A. So in the book from Jeffrey West, he is dealing with positive exponents, so obviously the alpha is the power law exponent. We are dealing with distributions, so in our case, uh, this sign, uh, it, it enters the equation with a negative sign. Uh, it's to the power of minus alpha. So again, C is a constant term, it's the exponent itself, minus one, times x minimum, so some, times a, a minimum value for which the power law is defined, so it's, it has to start somewhere, okay, uh, to the power of alpha minus one. So again, the, the, the uh, minimum value, the, uh, a power law function is usually not defined for, for the whole data set, but only for a so-called tail. So it's, in, in other studies you might read, uh, the, the 
the expression tail exponent. So power law exponent, tail exponent, it means the same thing. Okay? So uh, it's, again, power laws are usually defined only for a specific part of the uh, distribution and not for the whole part. So you basically, we have to model uh, one part of the distribution is typically, is typically modeled as a thin-tailed distribution, like a Gaussian distribution, and the second part of the distribution follows a different law and is usually modeled then by a power law. And sometimes uh, you have, for instance, 70% of the distribution, so probability 70% is that it's thin, that it falls into a thin-tailed or that is drawn from a thin tailed distribution, and with probably 30%, it is drawn from a fat tailed distribution, respectively a power law. This is basically how we uh, should think about it. Uh, the alpha must be uh, larger than one, which is also in, in important to uh, keep in mind, and we will come back to that later. So the power law exponent must be larger than one, so that the power law is defined. So that's it's a defined distribution function. So x, the, uh, the support, the variable, uh, obviously it must be larger or equal with the minimum value for, for what is the power law defined and it must be smaller than infinity. Okay? So now what is also important uh, to note is that in the uh, case of the classical Pareto distribution the power law exponent uh, is defined as alpha uh, equal with 2.1. So it's a very low power law exponent. Uh, this is what uh, Nassim Taleb in his uh, recent book uh, documents. If you read the book from Geoffrey West, he argues that the power law exponent of the Pareto distribution is 2.0. Uh, it's, it's obviously difficult to distinguish between these two uh, exponents which are quite close to each other and which are probably statistically hard, hard to distinguish or very difficult to distinguish, okay? So sometimes you hear 2, 2.1, so, but it's roughly around, la slightly larger than 2. So, uh, again, let's uh, continue the discussion on the differences between the Gaussian world and, and, and the real world where we live in. So here we have now, I gave you now an additional uh, example uh, we have now a power law uh, exponent of uh, 3.0 as opposed to 2.1 for the Pareto distribution. So again, uh, if we consider now, uh, the, if you ask us, okay, how much of the cumulative total do the largest 20% comprise? So if we consider the, uh, again, the, 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 this traditional Pareto 80-20, we have 80%. If we consider the Gaussian world is 44%, if you have a power law with an exponent of 3, it's 45%. So it's very close to the normal distribution at first glance. Okay? If we would just have this, this figure, so we, it would be difficult to distinguish between uh, a, a power law process and, and a Gaussian world. Okay, because also there's, of course, depending on how much drawings you have, on, on, on large is your sample, also this number uh, varies, obviously. And here I used uh, a lot of, ops, uh, um, I think it was 10,000 or 100,000, 100,000 drawings, so uh, there we can obviously uh, make a good uh, inference based upon a large number of observations. If you, have, if, if you would only deal with 500 observations, so this number might, might be right. It might vary between, let's say, 35 and 55. Yeah, so so it's, it's even more difficult to uh, know what, what's the underlying process here. If we now move on, we want to uh, investigate a higher level of concentration. If we say, okay, uh, let's take the largest 20% of the largest 20%, which are the largest 4% of the total, if we, again, if we have the Gaussian world, we have 12%. If we have the, if we have the Pareto 80-20 distribution, we have 64%, okay? Because it's 80% of 80%. If we have a power law with an exponent of 3, it's 45% of 45%. Uh, so it's the same, as I told you earlier, it is the same rule. Yeah, it's 45% of 45%, and that's 20%. So we see here, if we consider the uh, the, a smaller fraction of the larger observation, okay, 
we see that the uh, power law process uh, with an exponent of 3 suggests a higher level of concentration, it's almost twice as much as the Gaussian world. If we only consider the largest 20 observations, we could hardly distinguish that. But if we consider now the largest 4 observations, the largest 4% of the observations, we see there is a difference. Okay? So the power law with an exponent of 3 accounts for a higher level of concentration as opposed to the normal world. If we now take the next step, if we want to investigate the largest 1% of the sample or the, or the largest 20% of 20% of 20%, yeah, which is rounded uh, 1%. If we have the Gaussian world, we, we, we know already it's 3.6% of the cumulative total. If we have the Pareto 80-20 distribution, it's 50% of the cumulative total. And if we have a power law with an exponent of 3, it's 9%. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost three times uh, what the Gaussian world suggests. Yeah. So concentration, if we consider the largest 4% again, it's about twice as much as, the Gauss, as, as in, in the Gaussian world. And if we consider the largest 1%, it's almost three times a uh, higher level of concentration for the power law that has an exponent of 3 as opposed to the normal world. So again, each power law has a unique and repetitive scaling behavior, self-similarity, okay, governed by, by the same rule. Uh, and this is uh, how statistical self-similarity is manifested and how we can model it. So the model class, obviously, it is power laws. So and one interesting uh, thing is that there's a huge amount of literature, obviously, that, that, that has been dealing with this issue and, in, and has been investigating this issue. And uh, the majority of, of scholars, they agree on that, for, for instance, uh, asset returns, if we, if we use daily data or monthly data, so the, uh, across assets, so it, it might converge to an exponent of roughly three. Okay, so this is also an interesting uh, thing that you might, uh, might bear in mind. So let's continue the discussion between the differences uh, between the Gaussian world and the real world. Here we have, uh, I uh, have adopted a figure from my own book that I have published this year. Um, my book is entitled uh, Rationality, the Antidote to Being Fooled by the Industry. Uh, so in, in this book, this book deals uh, to a great part uh, with concentration across various domains uh, of human life. Okay, so and here in figure four, I showed you, uh, I, I plot the power law exponent alpha on the x-axis and on the y-axis it shows you uh, the relation of the top 1% of largest observations of the cumulative total. So we see here obviously, and, it's all, and again, this uh, power law functions alpha is only defined for an exponent uh, that must be larger than 1. So we see here uh, that as we move above 2, there's a huge, a very steep increase in this uh, metric. Now let's call it a, a distribution specific metric. So this, every distribution has a specific metric, uh, a specific number uh, for this concentration. Yeah? And here we can see that as we move, the more we move from, 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 from 2 to 1, we can hardly, dis, hardly distinguish anymore. Yeah? So um, if you just move slightly below 2, let's say 1.8, 1.85, so we see that 1% of the largest observations correspond to 80% or 85% of the cumulative total. If we move a little bit more, it's 99%. Yeah? And it remains there. It, it, it goes to 1 if the power exponent is 1. But if we have finite samples, we can hardly distinguish, distinguish it anymore. So it's very difficult to uh, measure very precisely the power exponent because of this issue. Okay, so if we move below 2, things become very complicated. Right? Things become very, very complicated. So, and, and again here, on, on the, uh, if, if we move down, if we move from, from 2 to the right-hand side, so to, 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 to 3, for instance, 
we see that the uh, that the function that the uh, uh, decrease here in the function uh, is is much less. Yeah? So it's it's not so sensitive. It's much more sensitive as we move from two to one as opposed to two to three. So this is an, an, an important to bear uh, in mind. Yeah? So the sensitivity uh, as we move uh, from two to three is very different as if we would move from two to one. So things become very complicated and very difficult as we move from two uh, to an environment where we have a very, very low power law exponent indicating a very, very high level of concentration. But we will come back to that uh, soon. Here we have a uh, simulation experience that I have provided here. So I'm, here I'm using uh, 10,000 random drawings from power law, different power law functions. Uh, I set the minimum value for, for which power law is defined uh, equal to 1. Uh, and the power law exponents alpha, they are varying between a value of 5.1 and 1.9. Just in order to, so that you see uh, how this would look like in real life or if you would simulate uh, such a process. Here on the left hand side we see power law exponent uh, that has an uh, exponent of 5.1 and we see here uh, that, that the observations they are very concentrated here uh, fluctuating around uh, 1 and 1 and 2 so the, the, the vast majority of observations is between obviously 1 and 2 and there are some outliers. There's one, one outlier, one specific outlier that is around it has an economic magnitude of around uh, 12, let's say 12, close to 12. And there are a few other outliers or larger observations um, that are around 6. Uh, but it's only, it, it's like half a dozen or so uh, for in a sample of 10,000 random drawings. Okay, so obviously this is an uh, environment uh, where you can make inference uh, about the sample mean. Okay, if you have the, uh, which, what, what you, if you write, if you, if you remember the central limit theorem, yeah. So here, obviously, the central limit theorem uh, works. So you can make inference about the, the sample mean uh, if you have, let's say, 30, 40, 50 observations. Now, let's move to uh, the uh, graph or the figure on the right hand side. Here we have uh, a power law exponent of 4.1, okay? And we see here obviously a similar pattern, but the uh, number of outliers, uh, they, are, they have a higher magnitude, yeah? You see, the largest outlier here, the, the, largest, the, the, the largest observation here, it's around uh, close, close to 20, yeah? So, or let's say between 18, and 20. So if we compare the largest outlier or the largest ob observation for power exponent of 4.1 given the sample with the sample uh, with the previous sample we see that it's that the largest outlier is ex exceeds an economic magnitude uh, the largest outlier from the, the from the previous sample with a factor of roughly 1.8 or so. Yeah? So it's less than 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 twice uh, as much. We see also other outliers or other uh, large observations, some of them around 16, some uh, we have a, a, a few that are around 10 to 12, yeah, but still the vast majority of observations you can clearly identify it's between 1 and 2. So here we see already a difference, yeah? so roughly as we move from exponent from 5.1 to 4.1 we see that the magnitude, the economic magnitude of the largest observations uh, increases roughly by a factor of two. Now we move uh, here to power law exponents of 3.1 and 2.1. On the left hand side we see a power law exponent of 3.1 simulated over 10,000 drawings. Okay, we see here the uh, economic magnitude here of the largest observation is around 140. Yeah. And again if we move back uh, if we move back, we had uh, of roughly 20, so 140 and 20, so it's obviously larger by a factor of around 7, 
Okay, so the largest observation, uh, as we move from 5.1 to 4.1, it was roughly a factor of 2, the largest observation. If you compare the largest observation from 4.1 to 3.1, it increased by a factor of 7. Okay, so and moreover, we see that the uh, vast majority of observations that should circulate between uh, 1 and 2, you can hardly see it anymore. It's, it's just uh, these, these uh, it's, it's, it seems to be just like a line, like a, like a, like a blue line that is hardly uh, visible anymore. It's, it, it all goes, uh, it's overshadowed uh, by the extreme observations that we, ob that, that we observe here in the sample. Yeah? So the largest one, we have, we have only, let's say, four extreme observations here that we can identify. One is close to 140, then another one that is close to 100, obviously, and we have then a couple, couple observations that are around 40, between 40 and 60 in economic magnitude. Yeah? So we have fewer, uh, ex we, we can say we have fewer extreme observations, but those are, have a much, much higher uh, economic magnitude. As we now move from a power exponent of 3.1 to 2.1, this pattern is even accelerated, so we, we cannot even see anymore uh, the uh, majority of observations that are between 1 and 2, we cannot, we, we cannot, uh, the, the graph does not uh, uh, um, uh, show this anymore because it's all of that is, is overshadowed by a couple of outliers here or by a couple of extreme, let's say extreme observations and one of them is roughly between yeah, 10 and 11,000 yeah and if you compare now um, 100, let's say 120 and, 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 and roughly 12,000, that's, that's a factor of, of, of 12,000, that's a factor of, of 100, right? Or close to 100, something like that. So uh, we see uh, it's even more accelerated. So obviously as we move from, from power to exponent, which is around 5, to 2, uh, there's an extreme, it's a nonlinear uh, uh, increase in economic magnitude uh, or in, in, in increase, uh, exponential increase in potential uh, uh, economic uh, or uh, let's say uh, as we go from, as we move from power exponent of roughly 5 to 2, the uh, potential economic magnitude of outliers is increasing in a non-linear fashion. And this becomes so extreme as we see here in, uh, if we consider the, the uh, graph uh, on the right hand side that there's only two extreme outliers and they overshadow the whole distribution. And this is typical uh, for this class of distribution. Yeah? So let's say, let's, 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 let's say okay, Let, let's just say okay, we have roughly 10,000 here as the magnitude. Let's now move on, now we compare the, 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 the Pareto 80-20 distribution, which we have on the left-hand side, yeah, which has this uh, roughly 10,000 in economic magnitude uh, ex in extreme uh, observation uh, with a power of one of 1.9. So we have here, obviously, uh, the largest observation, there's only one, one outlier, basically, or, or one smaller outlier and one extreme outlier, or ex one extreme observation, which has uh, 6 times 10 to the power of 4, okay? So, uh, so you see, uh, that is an enormous uh, uh, increase. Just, we have just, a, we go a tiny step from a power exponent of 2.1 to 1.9, and we see there's only basically, you, you can say there's only one observation that overshadows the whole, uh, the overall distribution. So all of the other, observations don't matter anymore. It's only this one outlier, basically, that makes out the cumulative total. This is basically uh, what, what we can learn from this uh, simulation experiment. So this is basically how we can visualize uh, this kind of distribution. So we, obviously, things become very complicated. So power laws and financial assets. So in his 1963 paper, which is entitled The Variation of Certain Speculative Prices, published in the Journal of Business, Beno Mandelbrot was the first to show that cotton price changes are governed by a Parisian tail, that is a power law. 
Specifically, using the model here, he showed that the alpha, the power exponent, is below 3, which has serious implications. And it's, it's, it's important to note here uh, that he uses a slightly different uh, probability model specification. Yeah? And in his model specification, the power exponent is 1.7. But if we put translate it into our model specification, uh, it's, it would be below 3. Uh, most studies, at least that, that, that I'm aware of, um, they use the same model that we use here in this lecture series. Yeah? Which we see here, p from x is equal with c times x to the power of minus alpha. It is interesting to note that uh, Eugene Pharma, who again, who was a student of uh, Bino Mandelbrot, he was his doctoral student, he published a comment, a commentary on uh, Bino Mandelbrot's article, which was published in the same journal ESO. Uh, and he commented on Mandelbrot's uh, finding as follows. The infinite variance assumption of the stable Paratian model has extreme implications. From a purely statistical point, standpoint, if the population variance of the distribution of first differences is infinite, the sample variance is probably a meaningless measure of dispersion. Moreover, if the variance is infinite, other statistical tools such as least squares re regression, which are based on the assumption of finite variance, will, at best, be considerably weakened and may, in fact, give very misleading answers. So, and I think this was a very interesting uh, comment from, from Pharma, uh, published in 1963, uh, Journal of Business. So, basically, what he, what he tells us here is that he was a war of the issue that if the population variance doesn't exist, you cannot use OLS regression. Okay, so obviously for, for uh, cotton price changes, we can see, or Mandelbrot has shown, that the population variance, that the theoretical variance doesn't exist. But even if the power exponent is larger than 3, okay, let's say it's 3.5, if the power exponent is 3.5, the kurtosis doesn't exist. The fourth moment is not defined. So if the fourth moment is not defined, you cannot use OLS either. Why? Because the, if the, uh, the kurtosis, which basically corresponds to the uh, variance of the variance, uh, so if the kurtosis is not defined, or if the kurtosis is, doesn't exist, the, the variance is sample-specific, which means in every sample you will get a different estimate. The tier statistic, if you use a tier statistic, it's always different. So uh, we can basically, we could rewrite, and this is also what I write in my own book, uh, Rationality, I come back to this issue in the chapter on savings and investments, and we can uh, uh, rewrite it uh, such as um, from a purely statistical standpoint, if the population variance of variance of the distribution of first differences is infinite, the sample variance is probably a meaningless measure of, dis of dispersion. So we, we can rewrite this, 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 this statement, because if the variance of variance does not exist, which, which is the case if we have a power law exponent of 3.5, then obviously the tier statistics become sample specific. So this is a very interesting thing. But let us now have a closer look uh, on power laws uh, on the whiteboard. Let us now discuss a little bit closer the properties or, char or characteristics of power law of functions. Again, the probability density defined as p from x is given by c times x to the power of minus alpha. And again, our x values, our power law is defined for x values exceeding a certain threshold defined here as x minimum. So note now 
that the power law function, okay, if here is x and here we have the probability density, so it is the only defined for a certain threshold defined as x minimum, a uh, minimum value for x, and the power law function is then looks then something like this. Huh? So and also it's also important to note so. Uh, if the power law exponent is lower, the lower the power law exponent, the longer goes the tail. Okay? That's also uh, an important uh, property to bear in mind. So the first question arises, uh, how, what's this value c, the constant c? How can we uh, define what is the constant c? So we know that a probability density function um, is 1 over the whole support. And it starts at x minimum and goes to infinity. So what we have to do is we have to uh, take the integral from x minimum to infinity from the probability density function and set it equal to 1. Yeah? So we take the integral from x minimum to infinity from the probability density function times dx, uh, which is simple in integral. Then we put in what it is, so we know that our probability density function is c times x to the power minus alpha times dx, and we know also from uh, high school uh, that because c is a constant, we can move it uh, in front of the integral operator, so we just have to take the integral from uh, x to the power minus alpha times dx, and we then we put the c, once we have solved this, we can just multiply uh, the integral with c. So now the question arises, what's the derivative? We can ask, us, okay, what's the derivative so that we end up with x to the power of minus alpha? And obviously, uh, we know that if we take the derivative of 1 over 1 minus alpha times x to the power of 1 minus alpha, uh, so if we take the first order derivative of, of this expression here, what is that? Well, it's what is here in the exponent, it's 1 minus alpha times the factor before the x value, which is 1 minus alpha, times x times this expression here, minus 1. 1 minus alpha minus 1 is minus alpha. And here, this cancels out. So again, here we have x to the power minus alpha, what we want to have here. So we know uh, uh, we just have to multiply this expression here times c. So and this is what we get here in parenthesis. It's c over 1 minus alpha times x to the power of 1 minus alpha. Okay, so that's the uh, solved integral from that expression here. And we know also we have to put in uh, first the upper part, which is infinity, and then x minimum, which is the lower part. So we have to, sub we have to first to plug in infinity into this expression here, and then we subtract it from once we solved, once we plugged in x minimum for the x value. So now this, this is now important to uh, bear in mind. So the question arises, when uh, does, when is this expression here uh, zero? So, and we have to plug in, if we plug in, uh, in infinity, so this guy here, if, 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 if alpha uh, is, too, uh, is too low, this expression here will not go to infinity. So this expression here only goes to infinity for alpha values. That's why alpha must be larger than 1. Okay. So only if alpha is larger than 1, this expression here uh, goes to 0 once x approaches infinity. Huh? So this is important uh, to bear in mind. So if, alpha, if x, x goes to infinity, this expression here becomes zero, and we have to subtract what? This expression here, once we plug in uh, x minimum, uh, which is, this, which is what, what we get out here, it's x over 1 minus alpha times the uh, minimum value for x to the power of 1 minus alpha.
And we know that this expression here uh, should be equal to 1. So we know, we put it on the left hand side, 1 is equal to what we have here, minus c over 1 minus alpha times x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha. So what we can do then is we can move this expression here, we can multiply it with, with 1, so we just move it on to the left hand side, which is what happens here. Then on the, on the left hand side we have 1 minus alpha, it's equal with minus c times x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha. What we can do then is we can multiply both sides with minus 1. Well, here the, the signs are changing, 1 minus alpha becomes alpha minus 1, and here we have this, uh, this minus sign disappears, so it's, it's equal with c to the power, uh, times x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha. What we can do then is, okay, we can move x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha to the left hand side. Then we switch sides. What comes out is that c is what? It's equal to one, uh, alpha minus 1 over x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha. And the next step is, okay, we can move what is here in the uh, uh, denominator up and we know from, from, from uh, uh, calculus well, what we have to do is we have to change this, we have to switch the signs here. So x, if we move this upwards, one, uh, x minimum to the power of 1 minus alpha becomes x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1. So once we do that, we know we have shown that c, the constant, is equal to what? It's alpha minus 1 times x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1. The next question that arises is, what is the theoretical mean of a power law? So, the theoretical mean, or the mean is defined as what? As the expectation from x, it's the expectation from x provided x is larger or equal with the minimum value of x. Because, again, because the power law is defined only for certain threshold uh, or above a certain threshold for x. So it's a conditional uh, moment here. So the first moment, the conditional first moment. And it's what? It's defined as what? It's the integral from the minimum value for x to infinity from x times the probability density function times dx. What we do here is, the, the, the first step is to plug in the corresponding probability density function, and that is what we know already, it's c times uh, x to the power of minus alpha. Now we plug just in, when we know c is a constant term, we can move it before or in front of the integral operator, this is what happens here, and what remains is uh, x times x to the power of minus alpha. And because the basis is, is the same, so what this expression here becomes is x, simply x to the power of 1 minus alpha. And this is what we write here on the left hand side. So this expression becomes c, the constant, uh, times the integral from x minimum to infinity, times x to the power of 1 minus alpha dx. And then again we have to ask us the question, okay, what's the uh, derivative, uh, or what is the function so that the derivative is x to the power of 1 minus alpha. Yeah, and obviously we have, uh, this is what we have here, yeah, it's uh, uh, 1 over 2 minus alpha times x to the power of 2 minus alpha. Well, if we take the derivative of this function here, we end up with this function here. And again, c is a constant term, we can just move it uh, inside of the uh, parenthesis here. Now we can just move it here back inside. And now it is important to, to note, so we have asked us the question, okay, when this first, when, when does this expression here become zero? So if we plug in infinity for, for x, we have to ensure that the exponent here is, remains negative. Otherwise, it would not 
go to zero, approach zero as x goes to infinity. So that is the reason for why the first moment is only defined for alpha values that are larger than 2. Only if, 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 if alpha is larger than 2, 2 minus alpha is negative. Okay? So that is the reason for why alpha must be larger than 2. It is very important to bear in mind. So, okay, let's say alpha, given that alpha is larger than 2, if you plug in, 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 in infinity for x, this expression here becomes 0 minus, now we have to plug in x minimum uh, for x, and what remains is simply uh, c over 2 minus alpha times x minimum value instead of x here to the power of 2 minus alpha. And now we know, okay, we know that, uh, that c, what is c? c is alpha minus 1 times x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1. So this is c. We just plug in what it is. Yeah? That is our, our c. And minus x uh, minus uh, 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 x minimum to the power of 2 minus alpha we have here. It's, it's the first term here. Yeah? And for c we just plug in what it is. Yeah, this happens here, and in the uh, uh, denominator remains 2 minus alpha, like we have here. So, now we know, okay, if the basis is the same, x minimum is the same basis here, and, and, and there we have some exponents, so we can just uh, um, calculate out the exponents, so because the basis is, is, is the same here, so x minimum, uh, we can just calculate 2 minus alpha plus alpha minus 1. Huh? This is just simple calculus for, for, for exponents if the basis is the same. So 2 minus 1 is 1, so nothing, nothing happens, and the exponent alpha cancels out. Minus alpha plus alpha is 0. So what remains is here simply uh, x minimum value to, to the power of 1, and that's just the x minimum value. And we don't have to forget the uh, minus sign here. So uh, then we can basically the, the factor uh, alpha minus 1. Uh, we, we can just uh, uh, leave it here and, and move the, the alpha, uh, the x minimum value uh, to the right hand side, which, which is here, what, hap what happens in, in the next step. So uh, we have to we should not forget here, we have to multiply this expression here by x minimum value, okay? So what remains is the factor alpha minus 1 over 2 minus alpha, and this minus sign here, we just move it into the uh, uh, denominator, okay? So this, it, it, it doesn't change this expression here. So, and what we can do there next is, we can we can just multiply this out here, so minus, uh, in parentheses, 2 minus alpha becomes just alpha minus 2, okay? And the, uh, no, the uh, nominator does not change, so what remains is then, if you multiply it out, uh, alpha minus 1 over alpha minus 2 times the uh, minimum value for x. And now we have to note again, so this guy here, we cannot we, we can obviously not uh, divide something by zero, okay? So that is another reason for why alpha, alpha must be larger than two, okay? Because only if alpha is larger than two, this guy here is non-zero, it's, it's, it's positive. So this is also um, um, important to bear in mind, so two good reasons for why alpha uh, must be larger than two, so that the theoretical mean of the distribution does exist. That is a very important uh, issue to bear in mind. So, and one can show, if you, we, we can do the same calculation for the variance for the second moment, where, uh, which is then defined as the expectation of x squared, provided x starts with x minimum. What we then have to do is simply taking the integral from x minimum to infinity times x squared times the probability, density, the probability density function times dx. Yeah? 
if we do the, the same steps, what we then would get, get out is that alpha must be larger than 3. Okay? So the second moment only exists for alpha larger than 3. If alpha is less than 3, the variance does not exist. And that's the result, obviously, uh, that Mandelbrot uh, got out for the changes uh, of cotton prices. And one can show in the same manner what one can compound the case moment. Okay, for the case moment to exist, it must hold that alpha is larger than k plus 1. And this is the general formula for calculating the case moment uh, of, of x, provided x larger than x minimum. So it's important to, to know, once we know that, the uh, kurtosis, which is the fourth moment, exists only for uh, alpha larger than 5. This is also what we have seen in the, uh, when I showed you the simulation, uh, only if, if, if the exponent was, I put it, I set it to 5.1, we saw that the uh, well, we noted that only then we, we can basically operate with the central limit theorem or we, 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 we know that the um, sample mean uh, converges to something uh, useful that we can basically um, make some inference. Uh, so the fourth moment, the kurtosis exists only if the exponent is larger than 5, which is also in, uh, an interesting and, and quite important issue uh, to bear in mind uh, when, 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 when operating with power law functions. The next important question that we might wonder is what is the cumulative density function? So we might be interested in knowing, okay, let's again, let's just plot here um, a power law function. Okay, we know here's the minimum value for x, x minimum. Here we have x, and here we have the probability density function, and again, here we have our power law function. So we, we could be interested in knowing, okay, what is the uh, probability to observe values that are, let's say, larger than x1? Yeah? So what we're interested in is the probability density here on the left, on the left side to infinity. So, the probability of x larger than a certain value x1, provided x1 is larger or equal with the minimum value for which the power law is defined. So it's p from x larger than x1, well, the probability uh, that we have here on the, on, on the uh, right hand side. Uh, and what's that? It's defined as the integral from x1 to infinity times our power law function, which is c times x to the power of minus alpha times dx. And we know already, we have done this now a couple of times, if we uh, take the integral, if we solve the integral for that uh, expression here, what remains is c over 1 minus alpha times x to the power of 1 minus alpha, uh, and then we have to take it, we have to take uh, first, uh, we have to plug in infinity for x and then subtract this ex from this expression here using x1 for x. So if we plug in infinity here, yeah, we have this expression here and we know already, okay, provided that alpha is larger than 1, this guy here becomes negative, the exponent here becomes negative, let's say alpha is 1.1, 1, is 1, 1 minus 1.1 is minus 0.1, and if x would become very large, if it approaches to infinity, this expression here cancels out, so because this becomes zero, yeah, uh, and what remains is minus this expression here, plugging in x1 for x, so it's minus c, over 1 minus alpha times x1 to the power of 1 minus alpha. This is what remains. And what we then know is, okay, what we can do is, we can plug in c what it is. We remember that c is what? c is uh, alpha minus 1 
times x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1. So we just plug in uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the expression for, for c what it is and we can move the minus sign uh, outside. Yeah, so we start with the minus sign here, plug in here, uh, see what it is, alpha minus 1 times x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1, times what remains here, it's 1 over 1 minus alpha, times x1 to the power of 1 minus alpha. So and now we can switch the sign here, so if we take minus, in parentheses alpha minus 1, this is the same as uh, 1 minus alpha, okay? So then we know, because this is uh, in the denominator, and in the, in the denominator we have 1 minus alpha here, and the second term of the expression, this cancels out, okay, this cancels out, and what remains is then x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1 times x1 to the power of 1 minus alpha. And now we have shown that our uh, cumulative density function is defined uh, as that. The next question that arises is how can we estimate the alpha given our data set? Which brings us to the maximum likelihood uh, estimator. So maximum likelihood principle is, is, is well known also uh, in, in finance research and is widely used. Moreover, the maximum likelihood estimator is, is valid even in a domain uh, or even in, in an environment where uh, a power law process is uh, uh, generated or where we have a domain that is governed by, a, by, 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 by some power law process. So maximum likelihood estimation. So we just, uh, to start with, we know that our probability density function, what, what is it? It's c times x to the power of minus alpha. Um, and we know that our c, our constant term, is given by what? It's alpha minus 1 times the minimum value of x to the power of alpha minus 1 times, again, uh, x to the power of minus alpha. What we can then do with this expression here is, okay, we can rewrite it, we can multiply it, the uh, denominator and the denominator by x minimum to the power of minus alpha, so that is in essence uh, 1, okay, so we can just ex expand, expand it uh, by this expression here. So what happens then is, okay, if we move uh, x a minimum uh, one side, we move here for the uh, first part of the term, and the second, the second part we move here. So the second part, we extend the second part of our function here. So what happens then? is okay, we can rewrite it. What we get is alpha minus 1 over x minimum, yeah, because if we, ex if we expand the, the first part, yeah, x minimum to the power of alpha minus 1 with uh, x minimum to the power of minus, minus alpha, okay, alpha disappears, okay, and x to the power of minus 1 remains, and we can move it then to the denominator. Okay? So this expression then becomes alpha minus 1 over x minimum. And what happens with the second term? Okay, if we expand x to the power of minus alpha with uh, 1 over x minimum to the power of minus alpha, okay, because both have the same exponent, we can move the exponent outside the parentheses here. And what remains is here x over x minimum in parentheses to the power of minus alpha. So it is the same function uh, as the original function, just uh, expand it. So then our, we can uh, set up our maximum, our, our, our likelihood function, or the likelihood function, so uh, it's depending, this is the parameter vector, okay, the parameter vector phi consists here of two parameters, which is uh, the alpha and also the x minimum value is a part of the uh, procedure given uh, our data, conditional on our data xi. So, and we know from basic statistic classes how, how we do that, how we set up the, the likelihood function, we have to uh, multiply all 
uh, the whole data set, all uh, observations xi, so it's then p from i is 1 to capital N, given that we have capital N observations in our data set available, and it is just this expression here, and the only thing that changes is, okay, we have to um, give an index i to our observations x, okay? So that is what is, uh, what is changing here, then what we know is, okay, we can take the uh, logarithm of the likelihood, which, is, which brings us to the log likelihood function, so the log likelihood function makes things much easier because the p sign becomes a, a, a sum sign, okay? Uh, this is what happens here in the next step. The uh, log likelihood is then from, is, is the sum from i is equal to 1 to capital N. Now we have to take the natural logarithm of each uh, element here. So uh, what we have here is, okay, if we take the, the uh, logarithmic form here, okay, we know from the rules for uh, logarithms, what we have here is then the logarithm of alpha minus 1 minus what is in the denominator, uh, the logarithm of x minimum plus this guy here, plus the logarithm of this guy here, and the exponent comes, we can, comes as a factor uh, in front of the logarithm of, of, of that term, making everything here the second term negative. So again, we have the logarithm of alpha minus 1 minus what is in the denominator, the logarithm of uh, x minimum value minus alpha times the natural logarithm of uh, xi over x minimum, okay? So now we know, okay, here we have no index, so on the sum from i is 1 to capital N becomes just n times the logarithm of alpha minus 1, yeah? So we have here n times, instead, as, instead of the sum sign, we can change it to just n times uh, the natural logarithm of alpha minus 1, and the same happens here. Here we have neither uh, an index, because it's the minimum value of, of x. We can take minus, instead of the sum sign, we can uh, put in a capital, minus capital N times the natural logarithm of the x minimum value, uh, minus, now we have to be careful, because here we have an index, xi is the observation i, we have an index, so we have to, we have to uh, keep the sum sign here, but uh, because alpha is constant, we can move it outside the sum sign here. What remains is then minus alpha times the sum from i is 1 to capital N times the natural logarithm of xi over x minimum. Okay? So the next thing is that we have to take the derivative of our log likelihood function with respect to alpha, because alpha, the exponent, is what we are interested in. We want to solve this equation for, for alpha. So we take the first order derivative, uh, delta L the, from the log likelihood fun function uh, uh, with respect to uh, alpha. Uh, what remains is here, okay, now we have to remember a rule. Uh, the, if we take the derivative of uh, ln from x, ln from x is 1 over x. If you take the derivative of um, ln from 1 minus x, it is 1 over 1 minus x, okay? The same rule we have to apply here, so if you take the derivative of logarithm of alpha minus 1, it's 1 over alpha minus 1, okay? Times n, the, the factor remains. Next, uh, the second, if you take the derivative with respect to alpha from the second term, there is no alpha, so we, uh, the derivative is zero here, and what remains is the derivative with respect to alpha from the last term here, which is the sum from, from i is 1 equal to n, uh, from the natural log logarithm of xi over x minimum. And if we take the derivative, we, we, we know that uh, alpha would disappear here in this linear um, uh, context, so what remains is then minus the sum of i equal to 1 to capital N from logarithm of uh, xi over x minimum. So this is what remains. And uh, we have to set this equal to 0, okay? And then our alpha is, is replaced by an estimate, so it, it, it gets a hat here. 
it flows that uh, alpha hat minus one. So we can now, what we have to do is now, okay, we move this expression here on the other side of the equation and we take the inverse. It doesn't change the, uh, uh, the equal width sign, okay? So what happens here is, okay, n over alpha minus one, we change, we change nominator and the and, 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 uh, and, uh, and denominator, it becomes alpha hat minus one over n instead, and this becomes also inverted, it becomes one over the sum from i equal to one to capital N from the logarithm of xi over x minimum. What we then have to do is, okay, how do we solve this equation with, with respect to alpha? Well, we can multiply uh, both sides with, with n, so we, we move n here, and we have to uh, add plus one on both sides. So we, we add one here to the term on the right hand side. So this is what we do here in the last step. What remains is then alpha hat is equal with capital N. So our observations, uh, and now it's important to know N, these are the observations uh, for, for which uh, the uh, x minimum value. Uh, from, from x minimum, the observations, the, 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 it, it counts the, the, the observations from x minimum to the last observation in our sample. Okay? Um, and if we have capital T observations in, in our sample, okay, this number is, is, is different. Okay? If we have just 30% uh, of our sample um, that is uh, governed by a power law process, then our capital N is smaller than capital T, okay? So our point estimator alpha hat is equal with capital N over what? Over the sum from I is one to capital N from the natural logarithm of uh, XI over X minimum value plus one. So that is our maximum likelihood estimator for our uh, power law function. And now uh, it is Im important to, to know or to recognize uh, that we have obviously many different candidates available. Yeah? So if we have here, we plot here our, our x values and here we have our, our alphas, our alpha hat, okay. So depending on what value of x we choose as the minimum value, we get a different point estimate for our alpha. So our alpha is depending on the, on the value that of, of x that we choose as the minimum value. Okay, this is very, very important to, to know. And if we simulate data, okay, what we will get is something like, like uh, this kind of function here. Yeah? So, and it's called, often called the hill plot. Okay? It's also important to, to be in mind, the hill plot. Yeah? It plots basically uh, the uh, alpha values uh, that we get from our x values in our sample. And uh, it is also interesting to note that in, in, in empirical work, what people often do is, okay, they take the, the, the point where basically the saddle point here where the, uh, it's called saddle point, okay, where we have like the, where, it's, where, where the alphas stabilize, okay. This is often used as the uh, alpha in uh, empirical work and here we then, this value here, we choose as the minimum value for, for, our, for our x, for our power law function here. So, and this is just a, a, a visual approach, okay, so we have our, our sample, uh, of, of observations, and we uh, use every uh, every uh, uh, sample observation as the um, minimum value for x. So we start with the lowest, and then we uh, move move up. So we we, we sort our uh, vector of observations from from lowest to highest observation. Uh, then we first use the lowest observation yeah, the, as as the first. Uh, minimum value for x, then we compound the corresponding alpha, so what we get is then the, the uh, first estimate here, okay, uh, 
then we take the, uh, the next higher value uh, of, of uh, x in our uh, sorted uh, vector of observations and then we get the uh, next value for our second uh, uh, maximum likelihood estimator of, of, of alpha and so on. So this is basically how, how people are doing. So if we have capital T observations in our sample, so we have capital T power law uh, uh, estimates for, for, for our alpha. And obviously uh, this n here, so if we have the first obs 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 observation, uh, then n is equal with t. Uh, if we use the second observation, then obviously uh, we, we only sum up from, uh, from the second observation to the last here in this expression and here we have one observation less. It's then capital T minus, our capital N is then capital T minus one. So and this is also for, for, for all observations, so uh, we have less and less observations here in our nominator as, as we have less and less observations um, that are governed by the power law process. So this is important to, to bear in mind. We don't confuse capital T and capital N. So N are the observations that are actually governed by the power law process, okay? So if we have, uh, let's say here, we have our X minimum value, here we have our X, here we have our probability density function. So, and we say that, okay, only 30% of our sample are, are governed by a, by a power law process, uh, then obviously uh, this uh, capital N is only 30% of our capital T. Okay, and the same is here. Only 30% of the observations are um, a part of the sum that we have here in our uh, denominator of, of the formula. So that's important to bear in mind when we operate with the maximum likelihood estimation technique. So we have obviously many different candidates uh, or potential candidates uh, for our corresponding uh, optimal power law exponent alpha. Again, our power law is defined as uh, P from X is equal with capital C times X to the power of minus alpha, provided that X is equal or larger than the minimum value X mean. We said also, okay, the power law function looks like this. Yeah? So it's only defined above the X minimum values, above the cutoff. Yeah? And the function has a long tail yeah? and uh, it's, it's, we also said that uh, if the power law exponent is, uh, is lower, so the lower the power law exponent, yeah, so this, this curve here, uh, it, it would go like this. Yeah? And if the power law exponent is, is larger, so the, it would look like this. Yeah, so this is also what we uh, talked about. So the lower the power law ex exponent uh, in, in economic magnitude, the larger is, is the tail, so to speak. So how do people proceed in practice? We talked about the Hill plot. So what people do is, okay, uh, first of all, you have a observation vector, a data vector, and you sort the vector uh, from lowest to highest observation. Yeah? This is what we have done here. Uh, X1 is the sorted vector here. We have the sorted vector and X1 is the lowest observation of our data set. X2 is the second, second lowest observation in our data set. And XT is obviously uh, the largest observation in our data set. Uh, so we use then uh, first the lowest value uh, in our maximum likelihood estimation procedure and in the Hill plot it is obviously here uh, the first observation giving us a very low value for alpha hat for the maximum likelihood estimator for the power law exponent. And obviously if we have uh, uh, X capital T, if we take the largest observation, yeah, then we are obviously here. Uh, it gives us uh, the highest value for the uh, alpha hat estimated via the maximum likelihood procedure. It's also important to know, once again, if we use the lowest value uh, as x minimum, 
yeah, in our maximum likelihood procedure, we have capital T uh, observations. So ca our capital N becomes capital T. Yeah? Recall that N is the number of observations that are governed by the power law. Yeah? If we have to use X2, so the second uh, lowest observation, as our X minimum, uh, then we have obviously uh, capital T minus one observations yeah, that are governed by the power law process. That means our capital N in the maximum likelihood estimation procedure becomes capital T minus one. Yeah? So we have obviously less and less observation as we move from uh, the lowest to the highest uh, observation. Uh, also, what's also interesting to note is uh, if we use simulated data, so the hill plot looks like this. Uh, so first, this slope uh, of, this, of, this, of this graph is, 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 increase, is, is increasing, and then it's decreasing, and then it increases again. And, this, and again, this is for simulated data, for well-behaving data. What people that typically do is, okay, they choose uh, the, the question obviously that, uh, that, that arises is, okay, which of these values here should we choose as X minimum value? So what people in practice usually do is, okay, they take the saddle point, which is where the uh, slope, where the uh, slope of this line here uh, has the lowest uh, increase. Yeah? So we see after this, this data point here, the slope is increasing again. Yeah? Here, here it decreases and then it increases again. That's the settle point. And this is the, usually the uh, uh, value that people in practice uh, choose as the corresponding cutoff for, for the power law. So that is uh, all values uh, above this value here, x minimum, are governed by the power law and the other values here and the other observations, so below x minimum, are governed by, by, by another process. Okay. This is important uh, to know. So let's, let's say, as an example, uh, we have uh, done the, the, uh, the estimation, of, uh, we have run the hill plot, and we figure out, okay, this value here, yeah, the corresponding x minimum value, is in our sorted vector, the observation 700, just to give you an illustrative example. What does it mean? Well, it, it means that only the observations from this uh, x700 to xt, these observations here are governed by a power law process, and all the other observations are governed by a different process. This is what it means. And then we can say, okay, so it means 70%, let's say we have 1,000 observations, capital T is 1,000, uh, and X700, it's, it's some realization, okay? And with, this means that 70% uh, are governed by a thin-tailed process, and 30% of the overall distribution are governed by a power law process. This is what it means. So our random variable, let, let it be a stock return or whatever it, 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 it may be, 70% of the distribution is governed by, by something that is thin-tailed, okay, that has a mean mu x and the variance sigma square x, okay, this is what we can assume, and 30% of the, of the distribution, yeah, the, obs the observations that are, uh, that are above the, re the realization, the corresponding realization of this x700, uh, yeah, our observation number 700 in the sorted vector here, 30% of that overall distribution are governed by a power law with corresponding uh, alpha hat here from the hill plot and x minimum value here that we, that we figured out. So what, what does it mean? So again, we are dealing here, we have broken down the uh, overall distribution in two parts, a, a thin-tailed part and a fat-tailed part. So in, in finance, what people usually assume is they assume a Gaussian process. Let's say here, let's say we have, uh, we, we, we plot the uh, distribution function for, uh, only for positive uh, 
realizations. Okay, so what what people in, in finance usually think is they they think or they assume um, that the that the distribution looks like this this green line here, uh, which is a which should illustrate the Gaussian distribution for positive realizations. Okay, this is what people in, in finance or what the, the methods that people use in finance, let it be GMM, OLS, all of these methods, usually assume. Okay, so they are derived upon the Gaussian assumption, and this would be then basically something like the green line here. Yeah? But what we have done is, okay, we said, okay, uh, one part of the, of the distribution, because we have obviously recall from the first lecture, we have three zones, okay, so the vast majority of observations, let's say 70%, they are uh, in zone one, okay, and uh, they are here, what you see here, but there are also observations, 30% of the observations, they are governed by, by, by a very different process. They are, it, they are fat-tailed, they're governed by a power law, which we have seen here. So we, we have broken down the distribution in a thin-tailed part, yeah, the, uh, the which is illustrated by the blue line here, yeah, that this is the thin tail part of the distribution, yeah, and we have a fat tail part, which is given by the uh, red line here, the power law process, that begins here after a certain threshold x minimum, okay, and here begins the uh, power law process. And this is what we also observe, obviously, uh, in real life, yeah? this is what we talked about uh, in the first lecture. Yeah? That we are we have broken down the distribution into three zones, yeah? and we have seen that in in real life yeah, the di distribution uh, looks different uh, from the Gaussian world. So the problem is obviously that the data is not always well behaving. And the question arises, is there any more analytical approach to estimate the power law exponent alpha? And the answer to this question is yes, of course. What people uh, traditionally use are so-called log, log regressions. So what, what does that mean? Okay, we know the, the power law function, again, p from x is equal with capital C uh, times x to the power of minus alpha, provided x is equal or larger than x minimum. So what we can do is, okay, we can take the uh, natural logarithm on both sides, okay, uh, from this function here. So what, what follows is ln from p from x is equal with ln from c plus uh, or minus, because the power exponent is minus here, minus alpha times ln from x. So taking the logarithm here, okay, we can, we just have to include here an error term, yeah, and now we can basically, we have ready our regression model. So the problem is obviously um, that uh, in real life we have to somehow to cluster the data, yeah, so what people usually do is, okay, where we, they operate with uh, some kind of binning. Yeah? Um, let's briefly discuss the so-called linear binning method. Yeah? So we need to bin the data in order to uh, run the regression model here. Okay? So again, we, have to, we start the linear binning process by uh, sorting the data, our data vector, from uh, the sample minimum. Okay? This is now the sample minimum, not to confuse not to, con uh, not to be confused with the cutoff for the power law, okay, the sample minimum, and here we have the sample maximum uh, from our uh, data vector. Let's say, okay, the lowest realization, so the sample minimum has a realization of 10, just to give you a figure for illustrative purposes. Let's also assume, okay, that the highest observation uh, or the highest realization of our data vector has a value from 1010. Okay, so and let's say, okay, we operate with, with 10 bins, okay, so we divide the, the uh, whole sample of data into uh, 
10 parts, 10 bins. Okay, so okay, how, how uh, the question arises, what's, the, what's the, uh, the bin width? What's the bin width? And we, ca and we can calculate the bin width simply by subtracting uh, the sample minimum from the sample maximum divided by the number of, of bins. Yeah, let's say we want to have 10 bins, yeah, 10 ups, because when we set up the regression model, okay, we want to have, let's say, we want to have at least 10 observations, so we need to have 10 bins in this case. Okay, so having done this calculation, okay, if we choose 10 bins, uh, and the sample maximum is 1010 and the sample minimum is 10, 1010 minus 10 is 1000, obviously, divided by 10 is 100. That means that the bin width is 100. So what does it mean? So it means that we, uh, that we uh, go from the, we, uh, the we, we, we go from the lowest sample observation in steps of 100, yeah? so we, we divide the whole sample into steps of 100. Yeah? So in our first bin, let's say first bin i is equal to 1, so we have observations that are between the realization 10 and 110. Okay, and now we have to look, okay, how many observations do we have here? So we count the observations that have a realization this is, that is between 10 and 110. Okay, so that's, these are the observations in our first bin. In the second bin, we uh, we allocate the, obs the observations between 110 and 210, okay? So the steps are always the same. So in the third bin, uh, I3, we collect the observations that, are, uh, that have the uh, realization between 210 and 310, and so on. So in the last bin, uh, I is equal to 10, we collect the observations that have a realization in our data vector that are between 910 and 1010. Okay, so what are we doing then? All right, we have our bins yeah, from 1 to 10. First of all, we um, take the average, so we take the average of the realizations that are here in the first bin. Yeah? So we sum up the observation and divide them by the number of observations here in that bin. And we take the logarithm. Uh, what else do we do? So we count the number of observations. Let's say we have, we have capital T, is, let's say we have 1,000 observations, and in the first bin we figured out there are 500 observations. Okay? So we count the number of observations. This means count. We count the number of observations, which is 500, and divide it by the overall total, which is 1,000. So here would be then the logarithm of 500 over 1,000. So the logarithm of 1 half. So in the same we do also for all the other bins here, all right? So we take the, the logarithm of the average realizations, you know, of the average of the realizations in the corresponding bin, yeah? and we take the logarithm of the uh, relative uh, frequency in that corresponding bin. Okay, so we get our, our, our data vector here, okay, that has 10 observations as we're dealing with uh, 10 bins. And that's obviously an arbitrary choice. We could choose only 5 bins or we could choose uh, 15 or 20 bins. Uh, so obviously that is our resolution. That's the resolution uh, that we choose. And all that depends, obviously, on the data. If you have a lot of data available, you can also choose more bins, okay? So that's uh, an important thing to, to bear in mind. So what's, what's then the next step? All right, the next step is then, okay, we say, all right, the, uh, we, we say, okay, the, the, the logarithm, the, the vector of uh, logarithmic uh, averages, this is obviously, we, we can, uh, uh, denoted as our xi, our um, independent variable, yeah? and we have here 
the second vector, yeah, the uh, natural, na natural logarithm of our relative frequencies, and we can say, all right, all right this is our yi, okay, and we can regress yi on xi. Okay, we, we can, first of all, we can plot them in an uh, xy a diagram, uh, xy graph, Okay, we have here our data points. Let's say we have here different data points. We have here one, two, three, four, five data points. Okay, now you may wonder, okay, why is that? Don't we have 10 bins here? Well, the answer is some of the entries here, one of, some of the bins might have uh, zero, uh, zero entry here. Okay, um, either the, 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 uh, that, that, the, that there's, there's, there are simply no observations in some of the bins. So, and, and obviously we cannot take the logarithm of, uh, of, of zero, so it, in, in empirical work it could be uh, that some of the bins have zero entries here, especially if we deal with, with fat tails. Yeah, we know that we have in the, in the, in the uh, middle, obviously, in zone two, there are much less observations. It could be that, that some bins are empty, all right, so that's why some of the bins maybe uh, we cannot uh, take into account. So we only use those bins that have actually entries. And let's say in this example here that we have five uh, bins that have uh, non-zero entries. And that we can use, and those we can use in our re regression model here. So once we have plotted them in an x-y diagram, okay, obviously the regression line, yeah, this is basically uh, which, which indicates us uh, um, a power law process, okay? So if we, re if we regress here y on x, the slope of this regression line is obviously the estimated alpha hat. Uh, and it's now important, important to, uh, to know, so because we have only five observations here, yeah, so the distribution of uh, alpha hat, it's distributed as a t distribution, as t distribution with five, we have, because we have five bins, minus two degrees of freedom. Okay, this is also uh, important to know, uh, because we have only five observations here, uh, but our regression model, uh, it has a constant term and uh, uh, we, we have two, we have obviously uh, two parameters to estimate the constant term and the, the alpha, so uh, we, we lose two degrees of freedom, so our alpha hat is distributed, if we run the, re the regression model, uh, at a t distribution with three degrees of freedom. And knowing that, we can also perform hypothesis testing. And uh, once we have estimated the alpha hat using the log-log regression framework, we can match the corresponding power law exponent uh, using the Hill plot and so we can easily uh, choose or select the uh, corresponding uh, x minimum value for which uh, the, the power law process is defined. The question arises, how can we use this to simulate financial data? What I provide you here is a simulation experiment where in the first step I simulate a power law function with a tail exponent of 3.1 and the minimum value of 3 using 5000 drawings. And I, and I store these 5000 drawings in a vector that I denote as x1. So, and this obviously is the fat tail part of the distribution. The second step is that I simulate a standard normal distribution where I multiply every negative realization with minus one, giving me the absolute amount of each realization. Yeah? So, and this is the thin tail part of the corresponding distribution. And I store, again, I use 5000 drawings and I store these 5000 drawings in the vector which I denote as x2. Yeah? And I, of course, this is just uh, one example. For, illus for illustrative purposes, I could use here different distributions for the thin-tailed or the fat-tailed. Okay? So using different tail exponent and different minimum values gives me obviously a different power law process. And I could use a different, uh, different process for the thin-tailed part of the distribution.
So this, the third step is that I simulate a random variable that gives me a value of 1 with probability 0.1 and a value of minus 1 with probability 0.1. Yeah, this creates uh, positive and negative realizations that are equally distributed. Or, and of, obviously, I could also choose here uh, a different distribution. Yeah? Of, of, I, I could say, okay, I want to have 70% uh, uh, of the observation should be positive and only 30% are negative. So I could obviously play around here with uh, all of the uh, input uh, uh, parameters. So I, I, I store the corresponding realization, these random drawings, uh, in the vector x3. The fourth step here is that I draw realizations from a random number generator giving me values between uh, 0 and 1 and I also store those 5000 drawings uh, in a column vector. And this indicates obviously when we are in the thin tail part as opposed to the fat tail part of the, dis of the distribution. So this is the purpose uh, of this uh, vector x4. Fifth, I construct the artificial financial data vector as, of, as following. So first, for each of these 5,000 drawings, yeah, so I, I search in the, in the vector x4, I go through each single uh, array yeah, and, and I do that. So whenever the random number generator in, in position i has a value that is less than 0.7, I multiply the corresponding values of the vectors x2 and x3. So, in, in the same array, yeah, in iteration i. And whenever the random number generator has a value of larger than 0.7, yeah, now I know, okay, I have to draw from the fat tail distribution, then I multiply, obviously, the corresponding values in x1 with x3 in the corresponding array. So, and what does it mean here? So, it means that the, this simulation experiment obviously suggests that 30% uh, of the overall sample should be governed by a power law process. Yeah? So that obviously uh, is what, what comes out here. So and then the last step is that I standardize the data series and I do, and how do I do that? Obviously this, this, you should know this from basic statistic classes. I just subtract from each realization in my vector. I subtract the sample mean and divide it by, this, by the uh, sample standard deviation. Uh, so and now here I have two illustrations, two graphs. One of the graphs is the standard normal distribution and, one, and the other graph is the uh, simulated financial market data. Yeah? So now you, have a, you might have a guess which of these graphs is, uh, uh, belongs to, uh, to what distribution. Yeah? So obviously what you see here, the lower part, most of you might have already had the guess that the uh, lower distribution here is obviously the standard normal. Now you, you see a lot of fluctuations uh, between one and two standard, uh, between yeah, one and two standard deviations. Uh, and you see that there's no extreme event, obviously, at least not uh, what we consider as extreme events in, in financial markets. So there is actually the, the largest observations are either close to minus four or close to four. Uh, you, you do not see, we do not observe any uh, observation that is five standard deviations uh, from the mean. Yeah? So obviously, as we said already in lecture one, uh, in the standard normal, for the standard normal distribution, this uh, to observe events that are larger, you know, that, are, that, are, that are far away than six standard deviations is very, very unlikely. In the upper graph, obviously, this is the uh, simulated financial market data, and it looks much more than a real uh, financial return uh, chart, right? So we see obviously here uh, uh, negative uh, events of minus close to minus 20 and we remember obviously that in, in October 1987 we had a stock market crash yeah, where uh, the, the, the indices fell by uh, uh, minus 20 or actually more than minus 20 uh, percent on, on that one uh, event. So we see also a couple of other events that are um, around uh, minus 10, minus 15, or on the positive side we see some events that are uh, five, five to seven standard deviations uh, from, from the mean. 
So obviously uh, this simple uh, simulation experiment gives me already uh, a data series that is much closer to reality uh, than the uh, standard normal distribution. Okay. Here I just uh, take in the, in the upper graph uh, I use the first thousand observations of the simulated uh, data yeah, and plot them here and in the lower part uh, of the graph uh, I have thousand monthly log returns of the Dow Jones 30 index yeah, for the sample from uh, January 1939 until March uh, 2022. Uh, and we see here some similarities and we see outliers or we see these uh, discontinuities, okay, outliers, discontinuities and extreme events that basically they are just synonyms for the same uh, phenomenon. Yeah? So large standard deviations from the, from the mean. And we see here that in the simulated series we observe uh, in, the, in the sample of the, of the first thousand observations yeah, we see uh, that we have events that are uh, between yeah, minus six standard deviation on the negative side and uh, roughly seven standard deviations on the positive side. So what about the Dow Jones index? Okay, we see also uh, events that are uh, six standard deviations away uh, from the mean. So we see that our simple simulation experiment uh, obviously captures the stylized uh, fact or feature of financial markets. Uh, uh, in other words, it allows us to model uh, discontinuities in the data. What we uh, have not uh, managed to, to model yet is the uh, self-similarity within the data series. Now we said, okay, we observed this uh, inverted U-shape pattern that is uh, repeating uh, itself across the time series. Yeah? So we, uh, our simulation experiment does not really uh, allow for that issue, yeah? but we modeled uh, discontinuities. So let's talk one more time about Mandelbrot, so power laws and financial assets, implications of Mandelbrot's findings for cotton price changes. So Mandelbrot found that the tail exponent uh, of cotton price changes is governed, uh, or that, that the uh, tail of cotton price changes is governed by a power law process with the tail exponent alpha less than three. If we denote X as the price change of cotton, so he investigated the positive uh, price changes and the absolute amount of negative price changes. Yeah, we recall that the power law functions are defined by, for positive uh, values, so we have to take the absolute amount uh, of the negative returns uh, in order to uh, run our model. So again, he uh, investigated the absolute amounts of the returns uh, at various frequencies, that is daily, weekly, monthly. Uh, and Mandelbrot highlights that if the power law exponent slope about the same across different resolutions, respectively frequencies, this is an evidence of a power law behavior. And, and Mandelbrot showed that the result of alpha is below three, hence regardless whether positive or negative price changes were considered and regardless of the time frequency considered. Mandelbrot's findings have obviously severe implications yeah? because a power law exponent less than three, as we have seen, suggests an undefined, respectively infinite second moment. And if the second moment is infinite, standard statistical tools such as OLS regression, uh, which are based, obviously based on the assumption of a finite variance, will give very misleading answers. This is also noted by Eugene Farmer, who was a doctoral student uh, of Beno Mandelbrot. So now you may wonder, why is that? Well, we talked about that. These statistics require the variance to exist. So in empirical finance, the estimated T-statistic you might recall uh, for a specific uh, data sample is simply given by uh, the sample mean. Yeah? And then in, in hypothesis testing, you subtract uh, 
this is x x bar okay and then you can test x bar usually you test x bar uh, the, if the sample mean uh, is significantly different from zero you know in this case this uh, new x you set it equal to zero yeah and you, and you divide it you 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 divide the sample mean by uh, the square root of the variance divided by the square root of observations. Now this is what you see in the denominator here. So and we note that if the theoretical variance does not exist, the sample variance is, even according to Nobel laureate Eugene Farmer, a meaningless measure of dispersion. But obviously this is just one example yeah, you could also use uh, the Sharpe ratio or any other cor correlation based method that somehow incorporates uh, the variance of some data series. All of these uh, are useless. Yeah. So, but that's, that's not all there is to say. So, power laws and financial assets, they're obviously opinions uh, among scholars somehow uh, deviate. So, for instance, uh, Zegnon and Lux uh, in one paper uh, argue that uh, the variance stabilizes with increasing sample size and does not explode. Falling into the, into the domain of attraction of the normal distribution, the overall shape of the return distribution would have to change, that is, gets closer to the normal under time aggregation. Hence, the basic finding on the unconditional distribution is that it converges towards the Gaussian but is distinctly different from it at the daily and higher frequencies. Yeah? So if we use, this is also what I learned in my doctoral studies, uh, people told me that, or at least one teacher told me uh, that if, you, if we go, if we use a quarterly stock return data, quarterly stock return data is close to normally distributed. So this is obviously uh, what some scholars uh, still believe. On the other hand, uh, Nassim Taleb, in his uh, book entitled uh, uh, On the Statistical Consequences of Fat Tales, yeah, published in 2020, he argues with respect to the well-known claim that the data may be fat tailed in the short term, but in something called the long term, things become Gaussian. He argues as follows, sorry, it is not so. The reason is simply that we cannot talk about Gaussian if the kurtosis is infinite, even when lower moments exist. Further, for alpha roughly equal to 3, the central limit uh, theorem operates very slowly and requires n of the order of 10 to the power of 6 to become acceptable, not what we have uh, seen in the history of markets. So what, what does that mean? So recall from basic statistic classes that if we have a, ran, if, if we have a random process that is normally distributed, you need a, a roughly 30 observations in order to make a reasonable uh, statistical inference. Yeah? You, you can use the, the uh, sample mean for the sample mean and sample standard deviation give you useful or reasonable uh, information so, so that you can uh, make inference based, based, based upon uh, these metrics. In order to have the same accuracy in the four random process that has a power law exponent of roughly 3, let's say 3.1, we would have, we would need not 30, but 1 million observations to have the same accuracy. This is what it means. But in financial markets, we have not observed uh, we don't have simply, we don't have so many observations. Yeah? So uh, we do not, we are unable to observe the sample mean, yeah? even for, if, even, even, if we, even if we have a power law process that suggests that the variance exists, okay, even in this case, in this scenario, we would have, we would be supposed to have so many observations yeah? that we don't, we, have, we don't have them available, simply speaking, okay? So uh, it doesn't make sense. So the, the whole argument of time aggregation makes no sense if the kurtosis, if the, if the fourth moment doesn't exist. So, and this is what it says. If you have a power exponent of 3.1, it, it, it suggests, okay, 
and given that we use return series, it means, okay, the, the me exists and the second moment exists, but the third, fourth moment do not exist. Yeah? So the second moment is very unstable, okay? very unstable and sample specific. So each sample, we would get a different variance. Yeah? So therefore, we, we have difficulties to uh, observe the mean. So that is basically what it means. So in, in, in finite samples and in, in real life, we cannot operate with OLS anyways, even if the variance would exist. So we talked about key features of financial markets. Uh, we have seen discontinuity, uh, self-similarity and memory. Yeah, we talked here about discontinuity and self-similarity. Now we know how to incorporate discontinuity in, in the data. Uh, in the data series, yeah, we have seen a, a simple simulation experiment how to do that. Um, and now you may wonder, okay, uh, what is more important to take into account? The, the other issues is self-similarity, how to uh, incorporate that, and memory we will talk about uh, in, in, in later lectures. Uh, as of now, we mainly uh, dealt with discontinuity. Yeah? But what is more important actually? So recall uh, the effect of discontinuity uh, from our example for the momentum uh, premium. Yeah? So again, uh, consider this uh, graph here. Yeah? We have uh, two different uh, distributions. So I have plotted here the compounded return of the momentum uh, payoff. Uh, I have 688 observations. So and in the uh, the uh, uh, black line, it shows the uh, evolution of the momentum premium over the 688 uh, months. Yeah? And in uh, the green line, I delete the 1% uh, uh, of the sample. Yeah? Of, I, I uh, disregard those observations that have the highest volatility uh, over the sample period. And we see these are completely different animals. Yeah, it's a completely uh, different evolution. So we have seen that, that only 1% of the observations, again, this is our discontinuity, uh, it, correspond, it, it makes out more than 90% of the overall total compounded returns. Okay, so it's a very, very small fraction of, of observations make out the overall uh, uh, of the uh, compounded return. So, what that means in turn, that the thin tail part of the distribution, which corresponds to 99% of the observations, okay, that's just noise. So, 99% of the sample observations correspond to less than 10% of the overall total of compounded returns. So, the thin tail part doesn't really matter, okay? It's only this 1% of observations yeah, that actually really matters. So therefore, if we are in this kind of random in environment, which we obviously face in financial markets, it is the discontinuity that matters the most. This is the most important thing, in my opinion, uh, that we have to deal with and that, that we have to take into account in our model building. Yeah. So because it it, this example tells us that a small fraction of observations can wipe out our whole wealth. Uh, our whole accumulated wealth can be wiped out in an instance yeah, because of this continuity. So uh, this is what you typically not learn in business school, but uh, I think this is important uh, to, to bear in mind. Uh, another real life example, let's talk about uh, financial derivatives. Uh, this example I have uh, adopted from my book, uh, again, uh, Rationality, uh, the Antidote to Being Fooled by the Industry. Now this book, again, I published it uh, this year. And the book deals obviously also with discontinuity and concentration across different domains of human life. And in the chapter uh, dealing with uh, savings and investments, I have this one example here. Uh, of leverage certificates with no maturity. It's figure six in my book. So what, what do we learn here? So this figure illustrates the price evolution of the S&P 500 yeah, over uh, 
the uh, sample period from 1st of December 2009 until 19th April 2021. Why do I choose the sample? Well, because this is the period uh, in 2022 I wrote this book and that's why I uh, closed this, uh, I ended the sample period uh, in, in April this year. So we see that the return of the S&P 500 is 300, uh, roughly 300% uh, over the sample period. But in, on March 16, 2020, uh, there was the outbreak of the worldwide corona pandemic yeah, and the certificate that promised a 10% uh, leverage yeah, um, ended up, in, ended up uh, bankrupt. So if you, have, if you had invested in the certificate, if you had, would have invested your wealth in this certificate, you would end up in default. You would lose all of your wealth. And it's interesting to note that the return on the S&P 500 uh, between the sample period here, when the sample period started, and it started on 1st of December 2009, uh, and so the, the return of the S&P 500 between 1st of December 2009 and 16th of March 2020 is still more than 100%. Yeah? So, uh, and this is a manifestation of discontinuity. Yeah, this is what people obviously do not tell you uh, when, when you buy this kind of certificate. Yeah, you, um, you might think, okay, uh, I, I don't want to buy warrants or, or options if you have a, a lot of money uh, because they have a, they, they have a certain uh, time of maturity. Yeah? So in, instead, okay, I, I want to have a leverage payoff on uh, some financial assets and that's why I decide to buy this leverage certificate with, with no maturity. But here you see Obviously, because the certificates are at the end of each trading day, yeah, the returns are compounded, and you see that this compounding effect yeah, can, can uh, drive your, your, you into financial ruin. Yeah? This is what we would have observed uh, during the corona pandemic. And there are actually only a very few uh, observations where you actually uh, would have beaten the S&P 500. Now, this is also, uh, I think, very interesting to note because uh, the certificates you can buy usually at, at, at any uh, online broker, yeah, and you might think, you might believe that, well, in the long term, yeah, markets go move, move up, yeah, and if I leverage the, the payoff using such uh, certificate with no maturity, I might uh, have huge profits in the long term. Yeah, but no, 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 this is not true. Why? Because of discontinuity. Yeah? So again, it's discontinuity that would wipe out your, your wealth after, after some uh, extreme uh, events that we here observed during the corona pandemic. So what is next? So we talked about discontinuity uh, in, in this lecture and also about uh, self-similarity. So in the next lecture uh, we will uh, discuss uh, memory processes, how to uh, model memory processes, respectively dependency structures of financial assets. Thank you for your attention.